Today, I will be reading from Luke chapter 15, verse 11 through 24. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Sorry, I turned my microphone off. Sorry, over the last few weeks we've been going through a series here called Finding Your Way Back to God. Uh, We've talked about a few different things, but this morning we're going to talk about help, awakening to to help. Uh, Today we're looking at this familiar story that Jesus tells us to help us find our way back to God. And really the idea for today's whole message is this, is that when we admit that we are powerless to fulfill our longings on our own, we'll discover that there's help and that help has a name and his name is Jesus. Um, Have you ever found yourself in need of help before? Uh, Has your car ever broke down? Uh, Have you ever lifted something and you you lifted it and then you're like, you're like, help, 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 help. It's something a little too heavy for you. Um, Maybe you found yourself in other situations where you needed help. Very, sometimes very serious moments. It could be a a financial or or a marriage relationship, a work, work thing that you find you're in. But we've all been to that place where we've needed help before. Uh, I think I've told the story maybe once before. There was a time where I was uh, spraying lawns uh, several years ago. And when I was, uh, one Saturday I was working. And I was working out in this field. And in this field there were, uh, the city had just mowed it. I was, mo- I was spraying by a water tower. And these weeds were, were four or five feet high. And so uh, they had mowed like one or two days before, so the stalks were really, really thick in the ground, and uh, there was some that was still high enough that I had to just spray over top of it. But I remember it was a Saturday morning, I was all by myself out in the middle of this field, and, and while I was spraying, I, I had a couple hundred gallons of, of, of chemicals to spray, and I had a hose that was about 300 feet long, and so it gets heavy just dragging it, but then as I was spraying the field, it it kept getting caught on some of the, the, the weeds, on some of the stalks of, of the weeds. They were just so thick that it kept getting stuck. And I don't know if you've ever done this before. But maybe you ha- have been in a place where you didn't want to be at work, but you were at work and there's nothing you could do about it. I was working on a Saturday, which was I didn't normally do. And I was, I was pulling trying to pull the hose, and it kept getting stuck. Every time I pulled it out, I tried to pull it back, and it would get stuck every single time. And so at one point, I just was so frustrated. It was just kind of a frustrating time of life in general, I think. And I just started screaming really loud. I'm like, what the heck is going on? I'm just out in the field all by myself, and I'm yelling all this stuff. I'm like, this is so stupid. I was beyond livid. I was so angry. 
And then I started yelling at God. Okay, probably not the wisest thing to do, but I remember I was like, what are you doing to me? Why is this happening? Why am I out here in the middle of a field on a Saturday spraying lawns? I thought I was supposed to be a pastor. I was extremely frustrated and I needed some serious, some serious help that day. Well, I didn't get help very quickly. I had to finish spraying the rest of that field. And, um, but we all know what it's like to need help. I was talking to someone this morning. They ran out of gas last night on the way back from uh, something they went to in Nebraska. We, we've all found ourselves there before. Sometimes we get in a jam, we get stuck, um, and we try to get out on our own. Some of those moments are, are funny moments like I shared. Some are very, very serious moments where you just feel so entrenched and you can't get out of it. Um, this series, we've been talking about how every single one of us has longings. We have longings to be loved. We have longings for purpose and longing for meaning inside each one of us. And those longings are given to us by God with the intention to lead us back to God. And uh, unfortunately, sometimes, like we talked about last week, as we try to fulfill those longings in other things and other people, and when they fail or when it doesn't go the way we wanted it to, we still have those those longings in us. And that leads us to this place that we call the sorry cycle. Okay, I don't know if you've ever been on the sorry cycle before, but we find ourselves in this situation where we're sorry for it. We, we want to change. We have regret. So we, we, we make a change, and then a week or two later, we find ourselves in the exact same position. And then we're sorry again, and then we want to change again, and then we change for a week or two, and then, uh, does this sound familiar to anybody? Maybe you know someone like this. Maybe this is you. You find yourself, you, you, you really are genuinely sorry. You genuinely want to change. Last week, several of you raised your hand saying, yes, there's a, a change in my life I need to commit to. I'm not going to have you raise your hand to see how many of you maybe didn't fulfill that commitment or didn't commit to that change the way you wanted. And you find yourself on the sorry. You're, you're sorry for what you've done. You regret it. You want to change. But it's difficult to change. You're in the sorry cycle. Uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, they have 12 steps that you take. And in these 12 steps, it's not just a, a one time you go through and you're done. Hey, I went through the 12 steps and oh, I'm completely free. I'm, I'm completely fine. That's not how it works. There, you go through this process and you remember these things. They get ingrained in your mind to help you through on a regular basis. And so it isn't a one and done. It's a, a gradual process. They, they, they do them over and over again. But one of the first steps in that process is, the, is, is admitting something. And it's admitting that we are powerless over addiction. We're powerless over addiction. But we try to overcome addiction. We try to overcome things in our lives. And we, figure, we find out after we're sorry, after we regret, after we commit to change, and then breaking that change and getting back on that cycle, we find that we cannot do it on our own. And that's where some of us end up. That's where we, we land in our lives is we can't do it on our own. And we try and try and try. And many of us have tried and tried and tried. And we're still in the same spot. Or maybe we're even farther down the road than we wanted to be. So today we're going to talk about awakening to our need for help. Sometimes it's okay for us to acknowledge we need help. That's something that's hard for our society and our culture to do is say, you know what? I need your help. Does anybody know anybody who's really, really stubborn who refuses to ask for help? Some of you do. Um, I know some of you didn't raise your hand because that person's next to you and you don't want to get in trouble later. But um, we all have those moments where, where, where we need help. All of us do. And sometimes we need other people to help us, even when we don't like to admit it. So this young son in the story in Luke chapter 15, verses 17 through 20, Nick read it this morning, but I want to look at 17 through 20. Kind of pick up where we did last week. It says, when he came to his senses, he had asked for his father's inheritance. He went out and he blew it all with wild living. And now he's, com- he's, 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 he's coming to his senses. So it says, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up. And he went to his father. That's what we talked a little bit about last week. Verse 20 is where we really want to focus today. It says, So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and 
he kissed him. As Jesus is telling this story, anybody who's around Jesus and understands this culture would realize that's not how this story is supposed to go. And, and I want to explain how this story would normally go if this happened. If there was a son in a community of people, so think of yourself living in a community of people, friends, family, people around you, a small little community around you. If people knew, which they would have, what this son had done, there would have been a much different response to him. If they knew that he wished death on his father, his father was a respected man in the community, he, he, he went off and squandered everything, and now he's trying to come back into community. But it says something happened. It says in verse number 20, but while he was still a long way off, we get the idea that Jesus, or that in the story that the father was looking, that he was scanning the horizon for his son. Now, some of you, you know your children well. If you, if you were able to look out and, and see a long way off, you could maybe see your children. Uh, some of our kids have, you know, uh, a walk or maybe they like to skip or, you know, run, whatever it may be. But you, sometimes we know people just by their, their walk. He recognized that it was his son a way off. He was looking for his son. It wasn't just a, a happenstance. I'm sure many people in his community told him, forget about your son. He wanted you to be dead. He doesn't care about you. The last thing he cares about is you. Day after day, we get this picture of this father who's out on this porch, just, uh, I kind of envision it, he's just out looking for his son, waiting and waiting for him to come home. And then it says, he saw him a long way off. And it says, he was filled with compassion. I don't know how many of you, if your, parent, if your kids wish that you were dead, and they took everything that you owned, a third of what you owned, and they went and completely wasted it, I don't know how many of you would have compassion on your children if they came back to you. Most of us would probably give them condemnation. We would point our finger at them. I told you. I told you so. I knew you'd blow it. I can't believe you're coming back here after what you did. But he, 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 went out, he had compassion on him. It's important for us to see he had compassion. And it says, he ran to his son, he threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. I mentioned this briefly last week. But respected men, Middle Eastern men, back in this time, in this context, they didn't run. They didn't run. And here's a father who sees his son a far way off, and he begins to run to his son. And this word run is not just a nice little jog. This is a full-out sprint. What it's it's saying is he he went out on a full-out sprint to go see his son. He ran. And so running, you could imagine during that time, one of the reasons why it was so, so frowned upon was because he was probably wearing a robe and he would have had to have lift the robe up and exposed his naked legs to go run, after, run to his son, which was shameful and, and nobody would have done. Plus, he was respected. I've never seen this happen, and maybe there's video out there, but I've never seen a U.S. president, no matter who it is, get off of... Air Force One, and start running to another world leader. Usually it seems like they walk as slow as they possibly can. They walk and they shake their hands and then they pose and they look at the camera and do all those fun things that they do. But but as respected leaders, and as, as this father was respected, he would have never, 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 never would he have ran to his son. But there's something he knew that sometimes we don't think about. There was a a ritual or a ceremony uh, that happened where if something like this happened in a community, in a community of these these people, um, they would do this ceremony called Kezaza. Kezaza was a ceremony where, where if a son did something exactly like this, they would take a clay pot or they would take some sort of pottery, they would take a pot, and if that son wanted to try to come back into community, what would happen is the community would see that son, they would look at him, and they would bring him in front of the the whole community of people. His dad would be there, everybody would be there. They would take a pot just like this, and they would throw it down just like that. And, And it would shatter all over the place just like that, and they would grab that pottery, and what it represented was this. You are cut off from our community. You have broken fellowship. You are cut off. You are ostracized from our community. You are no longer welcome here. The son would have known what was was coming. The son would have known that Kezazah was coming his way. But he had a father. 
who when he saw his son far, far, far away, before anybody could get a pot, before anybody else in the community could see his son, he took off, he picked up his robe and he started running as fast as he could before anybody would see him and tell him, you're cut off from our community. You are no longer welcome here. And before they could have that ceremony, telling him he's not a part of them anymore, he's broken complete fellowship off. There never had to be broken pottery because he had a father who was looking and scanning and he saw him clear way, way off. And he started running to his son as fast as he possibly could. He shielded his son from everything he deserved, from all of the condemnation, from being broken off from community. He shielded him from that because he loved him so much. The son deserved, he deserved that ceremony. He deserved to be cut off. But his father wasn't going to have it. What the story tells us is a God. The story tells us about a God who runs to us. The story tells us about a God who's present, promising to never leave us on our own. His son was in a pig pen. He had no money for even food. He wasted everything. He didn't deserve. And what's even greater is this. When the father saw his son, he ran to him. And what did he say? He, he embraced him and he, and he kissed him. And then it says, he put a robe on him. He put a ring on his finger. And then he had a feast for him. This is really, really important because everyone else wanted to have the ceremony. Everyone else wanted to cut him off from community. And the father said, put a ring on his finger. And this would have been a family ring that everyone would have recognized. And because they would have recognized that he could buy, sell, and trade anything in that community. He was wearing a robe, a robe that probably would have under, people would have understood or known or recognized from his family. And then rather than being cut off, the father says, let's throw a feast. Give me the fattened calf. And so he had this fattened calf. It's the choicest of meats. You would not make this on a regular basis. This wasn't just, hey, let's grill out. He's home. This is the finest of meats. This is a feast that he's throwing for his son. And he's saying, hey, come, let's celebrate my son. He's home. He was lost, but now he's, he's found. And so a, so a son who should have been completely thrown away from his community, now his father is saying, get the choicest of meat. We're going to throw a feast because my son that was lost is now found and we're going to celebrate him. It's the exact opposite of what these people would have expected to happen. That's why it's such a power, one of the reasons why it's such a, a powerful story. But it shows us a God who is with us, who's present with us no matter what. It shows us a God that's full of grace, refusing to condemn us even when it's deserved. I don't know if you remember growing up and you got in trouble, you went and did something, maybe you got in a car accident or maybe you spent too much money or maybe you, uh, maybe your shoes got dirty. I remember uh, my parents, one day we, um, we lived out in a wooded area and they just bought us school shoes and uh, they said, don't wear your school shoes outside. And as you can imagine, like any young child does, me and my brother put on our tennis shoes. Mine were white and red. His were white and blue. I remember it. And I remember there was a bunch of trees down here by this pond that was behind our house. And we were trying to see how strong we were. And so me and my brother pushed on this little tree. And it was kind of it was hollowed out, obviously. Me and my brother fell in the pond. And our shoes were now not white and green, or white and red. They were, blue, they were green and red and green and blue. Nasty pond water. We got in trouble for that, as we should have. Many of us know what it's like, as bigger things than that, to, to have to come crawling back to our parents or to that person saying, I'm sorry, I can't believe I did that. I shouldn't have done that. We know what that's like. And in this story, this, this younger son is wanting to crawl back to his father. And he says, no, 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 no. We're going to have a feast. Get the ring. Get the robe. We're going to have a feast. Let's celebrate what's happening. He didn't give him what he deserved. And I wonder if we could change the world more by giving people what they don't deserve. And the reason why is because none of us in this room got what we deserved. If you are a Christ follower, you did not get what you deserved. Last thing is this, is there's a God who's for us. He sacrifices himself 
when we're helpless to save ourselves. He sent his own son Jesus to come to this earth to, to take our sin upon himself so that we could, we could have forgiveness of sin and we could spend eternity with God in heaven. And so the help that we need and the help that we have, we have a God who's willing to see us a far way off and to run to us and to make sure that we're included in rather than set out from beyond everybody else in the community. We have help, that help, its name is Jesus. In just a few moments, we're gonna uh, receive communion together. And uh, what, what I want you to experience today, what I want everyone in this room to experience is what this son experienced, is that you don't have to receive condemnation for all that you've done wrong, but you get to receive communion because of a good God. Everyone in this room can be brought in now. My guess is there's some of you in this room and you probably haven't been a part of a ceremony called Kezaza. But maybe some of you have had family members who've kind of ostracized you from family. They've kind of kicked you away from community. When you needed to be brought in, they kicked you out. The good news is we serve a God who wants to bring you in. He wants you to be a part of the family. This young man didn't deserve it, but God brought him in. We don't deserve it, but God brings us in. I don't want to be the kind of church that has kezazah ceremonies where when we see people who don't deserve God, who we, who we think may not deserve it, when people around us have failed or they've fallen short, that we don't get that pot and throw it on the ground and, 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 and disassociate or ostracize them from community. That's not the kind of church that God wants us to be. Yes, there are people who are hurting, lost, and broken, who live very differently than us. But they need God just like we do, just like we were singing this morning. We all need Jesus. And so this morning, as we prepare to take communion in 1 Corinthians, it tells us not to enter into this time lightly. In other words, take it seriously. This is a sacred thing. This is an important thing. And one thing we don't want to take lightly is sin in our lives. We don't want to take it lightly when we we think, we say, or we do things that are wrong. We want to make those things right. And so this morning, before we take communion, let's make those things right. If you're here and you feel like that prodigal son, you were far away off and you wanted to come and explain all the things that you had done wrong just so your father could make you a servant. And people had pronounced that over you, kezaza over you. They've kicked you out. They've They've thrown you out. You have a God who wants to bring you in this morning. And so as we prepare our hearts to take communion, I want us to take a couple moments. It's always good for us to reflect and to respond to what God's doing in our heart. Earlier we prayed, God, or we prayed, Holy Spirit, what would you speak to me about today? And so my prayer all week has been, Holy Spirit, what do you want to speak to your church Some of you just needed to hear that it's okay. You can be brought in. That we have a heavenly father who loves us and he wants to bring us in, not to condemn us, but to bring us in and love us and experience communion and fellowship with him. Others of us, maybe we're followers of God, but we've completely blown it. We get the same response from God. He wants to bring us back in. He gives us those longings and desires to bring us back to him. And that's what he wants this morning. As we prepare ourselves to to receive communion, the celebration of what happened on the cross. Let's let's make sure our hearts are in the right place. I want you to bow your heads this morning. There's no one looking around. I just want to, before we receive this, I just want to make sure that our hearts are in the right place.